I discovered Chronicle, I don't know how long ago now, maybe, maybe say three years ago or something like that. And I remember okay. the day I heard your um, 7516 piece. I, I heard it and I thought, I, I've, I've got to learn this. And I, but more importantly, I've got to learn from this because there was so much um, amazing phrasing and rhythmic information in there, which I thought mm -hmm. I, I would love to have some of that language to be able to use in my own improvising and in different settings. And I just feel that... Um, Conoco is, is just so richly full of amazing rhythmic information and performed at such a high level. And the, um, the, the compositions which I've heard um, that you've performed, they often take very, um, what might seem like quite complex um, m mathematics perhaps, but they, they do not sound like that. They're extremely musical, extremely expressive. And I think you're... Um, Ex extremely playful with them actually and one of the questions I would love to ask you is um, what how you go about composing some of these pieces in particular the 75 16 but any of them what what was the process for that for you well there are like you know there are <clears throat> at least couple of ways that I always uh, think about composing pieces uh, one is normally I take the rhythmic frame like a rhythmic cycle frame and start for example 75 by 16 happened because it was a rhythmic frame that i i listened to one of my friends demonstrating that in in a, in a music conference so he was like just he touched the the, the tip of the iceberg and there's like hey this is something i gotta do something about it you know so then i i kept on like trying to do stuff on it, you know, you know, to go with the cycle, it's always, uh, uh, you know, it's easier, you know, like a ta, di, gi, but to go to the river, ta, di, gi, na, to, ta, di, gi, yes, na, to, which is... ta, di, that, that was really already like, ah, there is something here. And also I could feel the rhythmic subdivision in my mind, you know, there are mm. like two different subdivisions going on in my mind. One is the saying subdivision, one is the clapping subdivision. So there was this, uh, this constant uh, friction between these two things that is happening in my mind. I was like, wow, this is, uh, you know, like, you know, to multitask, when people say they are multitasking, I completely disagree with that. Everything is coherent, you know, it's all imbibed. You always think about two things, but you are always thinking in one frame of two things. 100%. I feel on the drum kit, you know, when we have the four limbs, sometimes it's exactly the same. It's interdependence. You need to know how the rhythms work together or they're, they're going to fall apart, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I started doing uh, like four over the 75, you know, then I was like, wow, this is really awesome. You know, it starts so simple. It starts with it. And then once it starts, once it goes to five sixteenth that's the moment where like everything falls apart. I was like, wow, this is something because that piece was originally six and a half minutes long, if I remember. And then I recorded that piece for six and a half minutes. And there was an one frame when I was recording, my son walked in from behind, you know, that was the first time I got it right for six and a half minutes. And then afterwards, like, no, you know, like there should not be children, you know, it's not nice to have children. Uh, then I had to redo it, but I could never get the whole material. Finally, I got only like three and a half or four minutes or something, whatever the piece is. So I could not get that two minutes long, extra long piece. You know, it was, it was for me inhuman, you know, like I got it one time. That was it. I have never got it again. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's, I, I, as I was telling you, like, there are some compositions which happen for the rhythmic frame, cycle frame, but there are some compositions where like, I think of their beautiful uh, rhythmic musical phrase, and then I just compose, you know, I don't, I just think of the 16th, underneath 16th, what's going on. And then I'll see what is the total number of subdivisions it has. And then I see if it is like, let us say 192. Then I think, okay, this fits in this cycle in this tuplet. Then I fix the rhythmic cycle for the composition. So it happens both ways with me. Wow, amazing. That's, that's amazing <laughs> to hear some insight into um, 
and see how you go about it. I've always been very curious. Um, and in yeah. terms of time frame for that, I'm sure I'm sure it it, it varies, and and to some ways, it, you know, it, it's kind of irrelevant. But for you, are these things that you you spend a, a few days, a few hours, a few weeks over, or again, is it just very so dramatically? It'd be impossible to say. Well. I, I can say exactly what it is. You know, some pieces take two, three weeks to compose and perform. Some pieces take 30 seconds to compose and perform. I just have an idea. I yeah. take, I do, that's all. You know, just very, very intuitive, instinctive, whatever you can call it. It's just then and there. But yeah. some pieces take some planning, you know. So I would say some, uh, like, for example, there is one piece which is 130 by 16. It took about two weeks uh, and Fibonacci, it took about 10 days. You know, all these things like but from the first moment the scratch came into my mind and till the moment I recorded, uh, uh, there are really complex pieces where it took like two, three weeks for me. Yeah. You know? And, and were you, is it the sort of thing where even when you're not working on it or not composing it you know the thoughts are, are going in your head about about it constantly <laughs> my, my head never stops thinking of rhythm yeah even I, now there is something going on in my mind i did a thing a little while ago where i transcribed um somebody's speech and and tried to pitch it and rhythmically <laughs> learn it on the drum kit and ever since i have to try and switch off when i'm speaking to people trying to think about the rhythms of speech <laughs> it's awful <laughs> In the seventy five sixteen one in particular, do you think much about the 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 contour of the pitch of your vocalizations because you it seems to me you're extremely expressive with it there's a lot of variance in pitch particularly in that piece and mm -hmm. the pitch seems to move quite beautifully with um certain rhythmical what i would call like symmetries and asymmetries so when yeah. just like maybe you'll ascend just before something resolves which adds to the tension you know yeah i mean um you know, that's one of the most, most important key elements of Konokol, you know, the pitching, the dynamics and the pitching and the, the intonation, you know. These three things are something like even now when I teach very simple thing to my students, the first thing I'm always teaching them is the expression, how to express things, you know. You know, first I ask them to exaggerate it to maximum, you know, like you can do whatever you want. And then, you know, you I add a lot and then I start taking away some stuff, you know, which is too much, you know. So as you said, the crescendo point when it really peaks in and then you see that there is something coming after that or when you resolve something like there is this thing. Yeah, this is very, very, very much something that's imbibed inside me there are a lot of things i cannot explain you know because mm -hmm. i have been i have been doing konokol ever since i was four years old which is like almost uh, which is 40 years now i've done konokol for 40 years and then my father he was an excellent konokol artist and then i have i have not heard anyone so musical in my life He's one of the most musical Konokol artists. So he was always insisting on how I have to recite. It's not about what, it's about how. That's mm -hmm. what I'm thinking all the time because what will come anyway, you know? But so the what was, that stage is gone in my life. I'm not thinking of what anymore. I'm always thinking of how. And then after that, I'm always thinking of why. These are the two important questions that I'm asking myself all the time. If I get how, the answer for how, then the next question is like, really, why am I doing this? Is it really necessary? If I get answers to these two questions, then I'll just go for it. Beautifully put. Um, <laughs> and I, I guess that comes, that leads quite nicely onto one more thing I was gonna ask about the composition, um, mm. which is, do you associate any particular musical feeling or any particular emotion with that piece or in, with your pieces in general? Or is it something again, which is just, subconscious that you, you don't think about it you think about the piece and and because you're thinking about how, how you're doing it the emotion comes that way well i can i can easily say that uh, 
there is this rush in the cycle itself like you know it starts very slow and then it goes and then it goes and then it goes and then, it goes, and then again it comes back to this so this feeling uh i don't know if you uh, this this was when i was a teenager even before a teenager there were these two uh, 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 toys of uh, maybe duck you know there was this uh, there there was this cup in in the middle so a duck is doing that 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 ding, it goes into the cup the mouth the beak then it goes up again the other one does the same duck 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 <laughs> So this was constantly running in my mind, like there are these two ducks. So one duck is the cycle, the, the rhythmic cycle in my hand. The other duck is my is what I'm, I'm reciting, you know. There is these two different things in different rhythms always going on. There is There are certainly images uh, in my mind when I do stuff, you know, like I always think like there is this, for example, these are all like square compositions, but I'm always thinking of like this ball hitting different walls here, you know, like that coming, you know. So a lot of uh, geometrical uh, shapes come to my mind when I do stuff. Mm. I, I, I feel like I, I hear some of that, the thing I said earlier about symmetry and asymmetry. Yeah. And um, that um, really strikes me when I listen to the compositions and a lot of music which I connect to rhythmically actually is that the, particularly with this, um, I guess you call it the Tala, the, you know, the five, two, five, four, yeah. five, eight, five, sixteen. 16, um, that, um, that sort of forces things to come together and go apart, especially when, yeah. when you're talking about when you start to layer up um yeah. even notes over the top of the form so it starts to to move um between the the beats and things it's um it's such you a know the moment thing. of like coming from somewhere and then and then again yes. go somewhere this is something i love you know there is a yeah. lot of like you know i always think of this this dna uh thing you know that's that's that spiral right these things are also like running in my mind like how does this work you know so i try to bring it out uh, not bring, I don't say bring it out. I think of those things when I do uh, compose, you know, a lot of things like that. Yeah. Images really, images, man, I'm telling you, they, they influence me a lot. I watched an interview with you recently where you mentioned that um, some, some drum set players have influenced you. I'd be curious to know um, wh which drummers and um, maybe if there's anything in particular about them that you find interesting? Well, one for sure, the first first person that I worked with that comes to my mind is Stefan Galland. I don't know if you know that name. Yes, I do, yeah. He, yeah, he's, he's, he's for me one of, one of my best uh, friends, but at the same time, he's, he's one of my uh, drum uh, set heroes, you know? And there is a, uh, one more uh, Kodo player from Japan. Her name is Yoshie Sunahata. She's one one artist I have seen, like when she plays, you know, uh, not her, not just her, not just her sticking, but even one of every uh, hair of her is concentrating. So there's a, there are a few artists like that. And then, uh, uh, hold on, I really, A lot of Taishan Sori, you know this guy? Yes, Taishan, who plays with um, um, Vijay Iyer and Steve Lemon, and yes, that guy, that guy, that guy. He's I'm incredible. He's, yeah, he's. I was think I could not get his name immediately in my mind, but I saw him play in Amsterdam, and I was like blown away by the way he was playing. Wow, was that was that at the Bim House by any chance? Were you there? Uh, I wasn't there, but I I go to that venue maybe two three times a year yeah, every year. It to was see with concerts. Vijay Iyer yes. and Rudresh Mahantapa and himself. Yes, I saw I saw Vijay um, maybe two years ago because um, the the one of his sax players, Steve Lemon. Um, played on a couple of tracks on a record that I played on. And so um, when they came to town, I, I went to see it, but it was a, was a different drummer, an, another amazing drummer, actually. 
I often play music which is would be described as contemporary classical music and at the concerts um, people often request like a program note to explain a bit about what's going to happen in the piece and um, I personally don't think it's it's necessary because it sometimes gives people preconceptions and I think that what you need to know about the piece you will hear you know but yeah. um, if we're if we were about to play the video of this performance to someone and they hadn't heard it before and they wanted you to briefly describe it how would you describe it to them uh... Well, it depends who is asking that, right? First, yeah. somebody who is a, uh, is a musician or hey. somebody who is a music connoisseur or is it a percussionist? It's a non-percussionist, you know? It depends on who is asking, right? Your answer is always depending on who is asking. Mm, good point. So say it's somebody who's watching this interview and uh -huh. if they're watching through my channel, they're likely to be a drummer, but they may not have much knowledge of conical. They probably, mm -hmm. they will almost certainly know who you are, um, mm -hmm. but they might not know that much about the piece. Well, I would say you have to listen to the, the piece, not as 75 bar 16, but please listen to it for the musical expression it has. Just forget about if we were right on time or if uh, how I have constructed the piece. You know, you can get into that on your second or third or fourth listening if you ever get to that point, you know. But I always beg uh, my audience to just listen to my expression. Nothing but that. Mm -hmm. You know, all the varieties that I do in my pieces from one to another, it's only to kill my boredom. But the listener, for me, should experience different emotions and expressions, not the different talas or rhythmic cycles or the complexities that I'm doing. It's only to break my boredom. And at the same time, maybe those difference uh, between cycles and then complexities will bring different emotions. So everything that I ask for people who are listening to this piece is about please listen to it uh, without any prejudice of complexity or, uh, uh, you know, how wonderful it is, you know, just try, forget about, even don't look at it, you know, just listen to it and then make your own expression or emotions in the end. You just feel what you feel like. And then when you're really into it, then you can open your eyes and then you can look at the artist. And then when you look at the artist, if you like the artist, then go into what they are doing basically with the rhythmic structure. And then if you're still in, interested, then go into the detail of the rhythms. That's what I'm asking them. Would you, would you ever consider coming to Scotland to do a concert together if I could make it happen? Well, is it like asking a hungry man if you want to eat? <laughs> <laughs> I was there. I have been there like at least four or five times in Edinburgh festival. Really? Yeah. That's where I live now. I live in Edinburgh. Really? Yeah. The last time I came there was August of 2018. Really? Where, where were you playing? Were you at the Queen's Hall or? Uh, Queen's Hall was before that. This time it was a bigger theater. I came there with this uh, uh, contemporary classical dancer, cho choreographer from London, Akram Khan. His name oh, is yeah. Akram Khan. Yeah. yeah. He, I, I've, I've been associated with, I've been collaborating with Akram Khan since 16 years now. Wow. So this is one of his last full time production that he's going to dance in. So he wanted his, one of his longest, uh, long time collaborators to be with him. So I came there and played three nights in a row, you know. Wow. There. This, yeah. Right now, the Edinburgh Festival should be happening, but of course, yes, I know. because of yeah. COVID, it's not. But um, hey, yeah, well, maybe maybe we could do a show at the festival one year. I could. Uh, I would love to. I would love to. We can we can do stuff together, man. I'm telling you, if we can spend some time together, work each other's music, you know, how to interpret, maybe have another melodic instrument 
you yes. know, there can, there can be a lot of things happening, you know, also work with different composers who are ready to uh, invest some time in our playing, you know, there can be a lot of things happening, you know, like you, 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 you can transcribe a lot of stuff from what we do. And then at the same time, I would like to understand what you're doing by your script, you know, try to interpret in my own way, you know, if you can give me the frames to try to put something inside it, you know, there can be a lot of things happening, you know, that's Work for it. sure. Well, I'm pretty, yeah. I'm pretty sure with a bit of time, um, we could make that happen. So, um, of course that would be, that would be amazing. Awesome. Um, Thanks for thinking of that. Oh man. I mean, it would be, it would be an honor for me. As I said before, <laughs> um, your, your music and your musicianships had a, a real profound effect on me and it's been a real, real honor to try I'm and so play a little bit. I'm so glad to hear it. that. I'm actually humbled and flattered when you say that. So thank you very much. Well, I saw it. Uh, that's what I was going to say as the last thing. I, I really like it. I mean, like the sounds that you've chosen is not the same sounds that I have heard you play with other things. No, each piece, I try and think about what sounds may work. So for me, with this piece, that I feel that the, the number five is so important. So actually... I, I I transcribed this a, a, a little while ago, or try you know try to get the the conical as close as I could, um, but I wanted to release it as my fifth interpretation because five is so important in this piece. So anyway, <laughs> um, there okay. are five five pieces on the drum kit, and I was trying to work mostly with five sounds um, to try and you know think about conceptually might work with your composition. But to be honest, wow. I was I was very nervous to let you hear it. But I thought it was No, would... no, no. I mean like there is always something that is coming out of it, you know, every time uh, another musician interprets my music, I hear things that I haven't heard while I did it myself. You know, that's something that I heard with with like I said like the sounding is so different and then uh, all the angles of the camera is also adding to to the effect you know because there is one static camera on me like that but yours is like black and white and it's going front and it's coming from the top and then we can also see these two little symbols on your snare what's that uh, so that's just um actually i can show you just give me a second um i have these these are like um what they started life out as bigger symbols and they've uh -huh. been cut down and lathed to be just small little bells, which... Oh, wow. So when you put them on the snare drum, I have to use a bit of tape so they don't fly around, but they, they sort of, they gate themselves. So they a very short, sharp um, kind of sound. And uh, actually you can see <laughs> from when I first started learning this, I wrote gi. <laughs> <laughs> on this <laughs> because I was thinking, you know, tati genatom. So, yeah, um, exactly. so yeah, I was. Just, I did a little bit at points. Well, I'm. I just. I'm very curious about. Like, let me ask you a question here. Um, I'm not talking to a drummer right now. Okay, I'm talking to a musician or a person who is who understands music, but. Uh, what what was your first thoughts about this piece? Like, what would you think that you want people to expect from this piece? I think um, the the beauty of the the tension and release when you have these at times together and at times conflicting rhythms, and I think that um, just like some people may say you can't experience joy without sadness, for example. When, when you're able to use such tension and, you, and somebody like yourself is able to be so playful with, with the rhythmic form, you, I feel that you get some feelings of emotion that you don't get without that dissonance, which then resolves. So for me, I, I hear tension and release and um, rhythmic counterpoint 
and those kind of beautiful, sometimes rhythmic illusions where you start to hear something which is, is not the pulse as the pulse, and then you hear the, the actual pulse being somewhere else, and then they rejoin. And whilst that might be the, the wrong way to hear it, it's beautiful to be able to hear it both ways and to hear it with different perspectives. So for fa- perhaps my favorite point of the piece um, but I, uh, would be some of the triplet um, triplet groupings that you use. You, you know, I, I, I'd be very, because I, I can't really perform conical at all, but the, you know, like the Tadikinatum, 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 that that ramps up so beautifully and then goes into those sort of groups of five in double time. Um, and it just kind of goes, and the tension's just going up the whole time. And then you hit that last grouping and you go very low with the pitch to very high and then bam, right on the one into space where you're really leaving, you know, like the whole five two open and like that's like a very slow build where you you feel like the listener you're just being toyed with and you're being thrown around <laughs> like a ball between the walls almost um but that for but for example to take that out of context it wouldn't be as effective if it hasn't had the minute and a half before that's it where definitely. things were yeah. ebbing and flowing you know and yeah, uh, sorry yeah. i've probably not really summed up anything now but to me when I hear things happen like that, before I knew what was going on and sat down and tried to f- follow it, I, I loved the sounds of those things. It's not the maths and it's not the, the understanding of it which makes it like, great to me. It's the, the musicality of it. And I think it's operating within those rhythmic confines, just as with harmony, an improviser would have to tell a narrative through changing chords or a changing tonal center. I think it's beautiful when you can tell a narrative through a changing time signatures or changing rhythms um, and, and maintain that narrative without it sounding like a set of rhythms, you know, and that's where the mastery comes in. And that's when I hear guys like yourself and guys like Tigran and um, it just, you know, it, it grabs me. Yeah. It's amazing that you you experience things that I, the things that I did not intend to. That mm. is the beauty of the music, you know. You just, you just want to people to hear different things. Though you're trying to express one thing, when they have different things, uh, emotions that they're getting, or they hear different things, that's that, I think that's the that's a very good direction of be, becoming a composer or a musician. You know, like give giving different emotions to different people you know that's the that's probably the the biggest reward for a musician i would say so thank you very much sure no thank you so hey manji thanks again for your time and for your inspiration and uh yeah maybe maybe we'll see each other in edinburgh yeah sometime <laughs>